Now, please silence your phones, watches, fitness bands, tablets, laptops, magic links, Newtons, and anything else that might make noise. Please welcome my friend, Scott Canaster, adjacent to greatness. It is 1984, <laughs> and it's my first day at a small but growing company called Apple Computer. They gave me a Mac. It's brand new. It's really cool. It's probably going to change the world. But right now, I'm just getting shown my way around the building by my new coworker. He says, this is an atrium, as you can tell. The skylights are made of glass because Steve loves glass. I don't have to ask who Steve is. Everybody knows. And nobody ever says his last name. And it's not Wozniak. Because he's Woz. Steve is Steve Jobs. Showing me around, he says, the floor is Italian marble. Steve picked that out. This is a compact disc player. Have you heard of those? Steve bought it in Japan, but they're going to be all over here pretty soon. I've heard of them. There's a really fancy piano over there, and there's a really nice motorcycle. And my coworker says, Steve got it to inspire us to make great design because the motorcycle has a great design. And that's why he leaves it here, in the atrium. And I found out later, the reason why it's here in the atrium is because it has a broken clutch cable. <laughs> and I found out that was the first myth I learned in Silicon Valley. A place that's full of myths, that's built on myths. And maybe the, the most common myth that you hear most often is, this will change the world. We're going to change the world with this. But I think maybe in this group, I feel like I might have stumbled onto one that's, that's really going to change the world. After all, the Mac works completely different from the way computers do. Does anybody rem remember what computers used to work like back in the early 80s when they were, a few hands, when they were green characters on a black background and you had to type weird commands to make anything happen and you couldn't make very much happen anyway? Well, the Mac was going to change all that by making a computer that was easy to use. And that's kind of what happened. So sometimes the myth comes true, I guess. But anyway, back to the tour. I'm still getting the tour of the atrium. And I see at the other end, there is the only closed office in the building. All the others are these Herman Miller or cubicle things, which I think I'm going to have to get used to. And we're walking toward these, this closed office. And it's a closed office, but the door is open. And somebody's yelling inside the office. And they're yelling kind of loudly. And we're going to kind of make a turn like this, so we go by the office. And the first thing I see when I peek in is an Apple six-color logo embroidered in the rug. It's pretty fancy. And then I see, standing behind a desk, the source of the yelling. It's Steve. And Steve uh, seems to be yelling about a printer. And it's a printer he is not fond of. Apparently, I'm picking this up from, from what he says. And there's a guy standing on the other side, kind of like this. Like, OK, OK, and not saying anything except, OK, OK. And Steve says to this guy, if you make one, just one, of those fucking printers, I will cut your nuts off. I swear to god, I'll cut your fucking nuts off. And I walk by with my coworker, and he's walking like, like this happens every day. And then I think, does this happen every day? <laughs> I know it's hard to believe this, but I was once a tremendous nerd. And not the sophisticated person you see today. When I was a kid, I loved two things. 
comic books and computers. It's not like I saw the future or anything, but those were my things. Loving computers was interesting because I had never actually touched one. And I had rarely ever seen one. Usually you would type on this thing and it would talk to the computer, which would be somewhere, and it would send stuff back to you. And that was using the computer. Still very exciting. It was a big deal when the thing that you typed on turned into a little TV set instead. And so now when you typed, instead of going ka-chunk, ka-chunk and printing on paper, letters appeared on the screen silently and got sent off to the computer somewhere that you never saw and then came back to you. Computers were in big rooms that were air conditioned and had false floors for all the wiring and were run by slightly older nerds who had graduated to the priesthood and knew what they were doing. So I never touched one. I knew about computers because of the magic of the science fiction movies of the 70s. The great computers of the science fiction movies of the 70s. Who remembers Colossus the Forbin Project? An amazing computer. The, the, the movie starts off with the guy walking into the computer room and he clicks buttons to turn on the lights and the lights go for about a mile. And then he walks the mile and he goes down here and he goes and light, 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 light. And this is the computer. It's a wonderful computer. It's super smart. It helps run the world until, well, I don't want to spoil it, <laughs> but a bad thing happens. And what about the wonderful computer in uh, HAL in 2001, A Space Odyssey? An amazing computer you can talk to like a human being. It looks at your drawings and it tells you how great you are. It, it psychoanalyzes you. It has conversations with you. And then, you know, a bad thing happens and it kind of murders some astronauts. Not to spoil anything, but for a while. Awesome computer, right? But one that really affected me was the Andromeda strain. Does anybody remember the Andromeda strain? At the beginning of the Andromeda strain, a bad germ falls to Earth and they have to call out the biowarfare. The, the bioscientists, really, not the warfare. They have to figure out what's going on with this thing because it's killed everybody in town. And so they send out military to go house to house to the scientists that are picked out for this secret team. And if you're one of these scientists, sort of like the Avengers of science, they, the, the, the military car shows up at your front door and they knock on the door and you answer the door and they say, there's been a fire. And that's it, that's the secret code. You have to jump in the car and drive to the secret lab in the desert and give the, the secret code to the farmer behind the desk and you go downstairs 50 levels and fight the germs. I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be the there's a fire person. Yes, I will come and save the world now, thank you. I, I wanted to be that important. <laughs> How naive I was <laughs> to want to be that person. But I didn't become that person. I turned into a person who likes to teach, who likes to explain, who likes to describe, who likes to share. Uh, I used to put on my resume, explainer. Then we got this word mansplain and it got a little more complicated, so it, my, my resume doesn't say that anymore, but, but it's still what I do. I write documentation. I write lessons. I'm a technical writer. It, it, it all sounds boring and it's, it is kind of boring next to, you know, the person who's solving the germs that are going to kill the world or the person inventing the iPhone or the person inventing the Mac. So. I've been around all those people. I've been really lucky. I've had a very fortunate career in technology to be present for a lot of these amazing things like the creation and the early days of the Mac or a piece of software called HyperCard that kind of inspired the way the web works today or a company called General Magic that was called the greatest dead company in Silicon Valley, which is a, if that's a left-handed compliment if ever there was one. And I'll talk more about that later. But I was mostly observing the engineers and the designers creating these products while I wrote some documentation. There was greatness going on. But I wasn't doing the greatness. There I was, 
adjacent to the greatness. And it occurred to me, this is my thing. This is the thread that connects my career. All right, now let's get back to the 80s. The Grateful Dead is the greatest touring band in the history of rock and roll, or at least the most popular one. They played before 25 million people during their career. Apple Computer in 1986 had sold 3 million computers. Not as good, fewer. It was the 292nd biggest company in the country. Also, worse than number one. But they came together in a strange way, and I got in the middle of it. I worked for a guy, uh, I worked for a guy named Guy at Apple, a real character named Guy Kawasaki. Some of you know him, have heard of him. He was in touch with a physicist named Betsy Cohen who worked for the Grateful Dead. Yes, a physicist who worked with the Grateful Dead. I know that may sound like I'm having a stroke, but that is, that, is, that is an accurate statement because the Grateful Dead are very into the science of sound, if you know a lot about them, and, and Betsy worked with them. And Guy called me into his office and said, let's put on a concert just for employees with the Grateful Dead, and we'll give them some Macs in exchange, because Macs were kind of new and sexy, and, and uh, he had this notion that the Grateful Dead were uh, a big deal and would come do this. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll take care of that for you. <laughs> so I called Betsy Cohn and I told her our genius plan and she said, they don't do bar mitzvahs. <laughs> By which she meant, they don't come and do little piddly one-off shows even if you are the 292nd biggest company in the world or the country. So thinking fast, I said, okay, what if we sent you some, com some computers and you wrote some music on them, and then you came and gave a talk and demoed the music, and, and we'll negotiate whether you return the computers or not, which means we wouldn't ask for them back. And she said, okay, we can do that. That's a good idea. So I went back to Guy with the deal, and he was happy with that, and we proceeded. And now, <laughs> We really didn't know what we'd gotten into by hooking up with the Grateful Dead in that, remember they were number one, we were number 292. We didn't really realize that. We, Guy and I, were not deadheads. As the time passed, leading up to the demo, we realized we had booked them into a 400 seat auditorium <laughs> and we got very nervous. This was not the apple of today with its state of the art security and ring campus and spaceship and all that. This was just a building and sign in when you get there. So we got really concerned that we were gonna be overrun by deadheads. And so we did the only wise thing to do, we didn't tell anybody about the demo. We didn't even tell people at Apple. We kind of went too far in the other direction. And then the day of the demo came and we realized nobody's gonna show up. We literally didn't tell anybody outside of our little group. So I frantically ran around the building, putting up posters, going into offices, I had Grateful Dead's coming today, did what? And somehow, magically, we managed to fill up most of the auditorium by the time they got there. And we didn't know who was like the Grateful Dead, we didn't know who was coming from the band. We had no particular commitments of it, you know, if it would be this person or that. So I was in charge of hosting them. So I got a call, oh, Grateful Dead's here. So I went to greet them, and it turned out we had Bob Weir and John Perry Barlow, who's best known uh, for lyrics. And I didn't know them, but I met them, and they were very gracious, and there were a few other people with them that aren't in the band that I didn't know, and we toured them around campus a little bit. And uh, we went to the auditorium, which was half full, three quarters full, which I thought this is probably not too impressive to them, but they didn't seem to care. And they went up on stage, and they started to tell the story of the music, show us Play us the music that you wrote with Max. And Barlow is talking and he says, 
Well, we had a song almost finished. And then last night, about 2 a.m., the Mac crashed. And it took the song down with it. Gone from the disc, completely gone. And we're all like, we killed a Grateful Dead song. <laughs> oh, no. And all the deadheads in the company had come to fill the auditorium, the ones that knew about it. You know, later I heard from ones who didn't know who wanted to kill me. But they're all like, oh. And then a really funny thing happened. Barlow kind of sat there, and he looked at the crowd, and, and he said, OK, this story I've been telling you, this is a fiction. We didn't write any music on these computers. We mostly played games on them. I think the accounting department used them. But we liked them. And, and I had to tell you the truth. I came here all prepared to lie. But I didn't expect that the room would be filled with deadheads. It's bad karma to lie to deadheads. And to lie to you about this would be like drowning puppies. And everybody's like, yeah, I don't know what. And then, you know, they want to ask questions like about, you know, what, when did the third verse of, I don't know. <laughs> and, but they're taking this all in, and it's amazing. It's amazing that he reversed course in the middle of his conversation and, and came clean like that. And he said, but we do like the computers. Can we keep them? And, you know, we were going to let him keep him anyway. And, uh, and then a really funny thing happened, which is it turned out that Barlow was not just a lyricist. He's also uh, very active in uh, cybersecurity and privacy and had been for a while. He had held elective office. And he saw this as the cyber frontier, as a new opening, a new way to approach privacy and digital rights. And we talked quite a bit over the next couple of years, and he kept the computers like they kept the computers, like I said. And then uh, he founded, co-founded a group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. Has anybody heard of the EFF? Which, is, which fights really hard for privacy and security on the internet. And um, Barlow, bless him, wrote uh, that the EFF would not have happened without me. Now. This is not true, I'm here to tell you. He was being very generous. But I still put it on my resume. just like we practiced. I'm waiting for Steve Jobs. How did I get here? Well, the Mac came out, and despite the incredible work by the most amazing collection of people I have ever seen, including Steve Jobs himself, a visionary and a great leader, the Mac did not succeed commercially. Didn't do well. And Apple kicked Steve out of his own company. Kicked him right out. Steve started a new company called Next. And Apple sued him. To which Steve said, it's hard to believe that Apple thinks they can't compete with six people in blue jeans. Because that's kind of what Next was in the beginning. Next pretty much invented the term stealth mode. They didn't tell anybody what they were doing. And you know when you don't tell anybody what you're doing, everybody wants to know what you're doing. And I did too. And I happened to have a few connections. And I happened to be interested in a new job. So I got myself an interview at Next. The interview took all day. I interviewed with eight people probably a fifth of the company at the time. But you know, Silicon Valley, that's how we do it. And every time I asked somebody to tell me more about what they were doing, I got exactly the same answer. 
you have to take a leap of faith. Okay? And I guess I passed the first eight people because now I'm waiting for Steve Jobs. Everybody has to interview with Steve Jobs to get into the company at this point. So I'm waiting and they're offering me water and herbal tea and Odwalla and whatever and I, 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 I'm having some and declining some and after waiting not too long, here he comes. Steve Jobs comes into the room. And he picks up the paper that's my resume, I guess, and he looks at it for a minute. And he puts it down and he looks me right in the eye and he says, are you the greatest technical writer in the world? <laughs> and I consider that. And I think, and I say, well, no. The greatest technical writer in the world is my friend Caroline Rose, and she already works here at Next. <laughs> See, like a dummy, I answered the question. Fool. He seemed really uh, dismayed. Even though he already had the best technical writer in the world, he didn't seem to like the answer too much. So he considered, and then he said, all right, are you the second best technical writer in the world? <laughs> and I can be taught. So I said, yes, I am the second best technical writer in the world. He liked that. He thought that was a really good answer. And we talked for a while, and he asked me other uh, perhaps more conventional questions, and we went back and forth for a little while, and I started to feel like the interview was going well, like maybe I was going to be offered this job. And I started to think about what it really might mean to work there. And I said, um, can you tell me a little more about what you're doing? And he said, you have to take a leap of faith. And, and then he said, but I, there's something I can show you. And he called to somebody to bring him something. And somebody brought him uh, a chip, an integrated circuit. And I guess it was a custom made integrated circuit. It was pretty advanced for those days, 1987. and he kind of smiled and handed it to me, and I looked at it, and I am not an expert in these things. I don't know what to look for. I don't know how to be impressed. And so it was not useful to me. I, looked, I shook it, I think. I don't know why. I may have held it up to my ear, and I thought, you know, this might, this might be a toy. Maybe they got this at Radio Shack. I don't know what this is. So, but I was polite. I said, oh, okay, that's, you know. And it turned out it was really cool, but I didn't know. So. So we went on, and it, like I said, it seemed to go well. And the interview ended, and I went home. Next day, I get the first FedEx I've ever received in my life. And it's from Next. Actually, I'm not even sure it's FedEx. It might be some other company that existed then. Overnight mail, it's an offer letter to work at Next. And it details the salary and the job and everything, and, um, and at the bottom, it's signed by Steve Jobs, and there's a signature line. And on the signature line it says, I accept this insanely great offer. <laughs> but I really had my doubts. They wouldn't tell me what they were working on. They wouldn't show me anything that might be interesting. It was the whole leap of faith thing. And most importantly, I didn't really know. I thought I knew who Steve Jobs was, but I didn't. I thought Steve Jobs was a guy who started a great company and was amazing and a fantastic leader and helped make the Mac and then faded away. I didn't know. I may have seen comic books and computers coming, but I didn't know what was going to happen with Steve Jobs. So I turned the offer down. They called me up and said, what do you think? And I said, I'm going to decline. I decline the offer. Really? Really you're going to decline? Yes. OK, but just so you know, Steve's going to call you too. Bye. <laughs> so I thought, OK, I've declined. I'll decline to Steve too. And the phone rang like an unnaturally short amount of time later, like half a second. And it was Steve Jobs. And I said hello, and he said, Hi, Scott, I just want to make sure 
that I know what I heard. I heard that you want to pass up on the chance to work with the greatest company in the Valley, the best people ever assembled on the coolest product ever. Do I have that right? Is that correct? <laughs> and I said, um, ah. I made sounds. I didn't know what to say. Couldn't say yes. I, uh, eventually I came to my senses and said, ah. Uh, <laughs> I have decided, you know, not to come work there. Yes, that's true. And he said, really? You're not going to come work here? And I said, no, I, I, I'm just not. I didn't, I was going to say, I couldn't make a leap of faith, but I didn't want to go there. I just said no, because I really wanted to get off the phone as fast as possible, since I'd made my decision. And he said, okay, well, I just want you to know that part of the job interview is an IQ test. Are you smart enough to take it? And you failed. <laughs> Any sufficiently advanced technology is equivalent to magic, said Arthur C. Clarke. A company was started based on that name called General Magic. Pretty clever. The idea was we have General Electric, we have General Foods, we have General Mills. A technology company should be General Magic. If it's sufficiently advanced, then it makes sense to call it that. It wasn't hubris. There was other stuff that was hubris, but that was, it was just, it was just clever. And I heard about this company. I was still working at Apple, and this, this company was, was a rumor floating around. And I heard about the rumor. And since I was still looking for some other place to work, I thought, maybe I could work at this cool new company. This is kind of another theme of my career. Go to work at that cool new company. My wife knows that I go through this pattern. And I managed to get an interview there. Now, General Magic was started by, among others, Bill Atkinson and Andy Hertzfeld, two guys who really gave the personality to the original Mac by writing most of the software that interacts with people. They're really the, the, the soul of the original Mac, and they were two of my heroes in Silicon Valley. And have you ever heard the saying, don't meet your heroes? Well, uh, I didn't have to meet my heroes, I had to interview with them. And I was terrified to interview with them. Because like they would say, and then we're going to probably you know, make this device. And I would say, yeah, oh, that's cool, that's great. I had a really hard time reeling myself in. But I, I did manage to do well enough speaking to them that I got hired to write documentation as employee number 14 at General Magic. And General Magic was very ambitious. They wanted to make a device that you could put in your pocket that would make phone calls, send messages, receive them, let you go shopping, play games, sounds. Does it sound familiar at all? The thing was, this was 1990. The iPhone came out in 2007. So it was even more ambitious than it sounds. General Magic didn't have just great engineers. It had a great graphic designer, Susan Kerr. Susan Kerr, who was the graphic designer on the original Mac and did the fonts and the icons and a lot of the designs and has gone on to do a world of incredible work. She designed the logo for General Magic. And we didn't have a product right away, but we had a great logo. We had like the world's greatest logo and everybody wanted to, to have things with the logo on it. We had t-shirts, we had great merch. We had towels. We didn't sell this. This is from the company Picnic. Everybody keeps their towels from 30 years ago, right? <laughs> well, this one I do. But we did have great engineers. And we had engineers who were people's heroes. And when you have people's heroes, other people want to come work with their heroes. And this attracted incredible talent to the company. It built up a great team. Uh, one day I came to work and there was a guy I didn't recognize and he seemed to be working on our code. Like, 
There were only 14 people at the company, so this was a little bit alarming. He seemed like he fit in, but I'd never seen him before. So I said, hey, what, why, who is this guy? What's he doing? And they said, oh, that's Zarko. And I said, oh, who is Zarko? Why is he writing our code? Does he work here? No, he doesn't work. Well, what is going on? Oh, he's going to work here. We're probably going to hire him. And so he's writing some code before he works here. And I'm, I don't know what is going on. So I just say, okay. I mean, it seemed reasonable to me somehow. Pretty soon we hired Zarko. He'd written the code before he worked there. I think that's a record. Doing work before you work there. And pretty soon uh, I came to work and Zarko is pounding. He's building something in his cubicle. What are you doing? I'm building a loft. He's building a loft above his cubicle. Why? So he can sleep in it, obviously. Because he wants to work late, he wants to work whenever he wants, he doesn't want to go home all the time, so he can sleep in the loft. Okay, this makes sense to me too, because this is the way we do things. So that's Zarko. That's one of the many people who came to work at General Magic because their heroes were already working there. And heroes tend to attract heroes, talent attracts talent, uh, with some screening. And that's how we built up this team at General Magic. Now, we, like I said, we were sort of trying to make an iPhone in 1990, early 90s. And that's a lot. There's a lot to do. And you need partners. We had partners. Every major electronics firm in the world, Sony, Matsushita, Philips, every major telecom company in the world, AT&T, Nortel, Japanese telephone company, uh, British and French telephone companies had all invested a lot of money in General Magic and were our partners. We seemed to be a big deal. We had a documentarian come to start to film a documentary on us before we really did anything for when we were a big deal later. And this made sense because it was pretty clear that we were at least something special. And we worked. Uh, and some worked really hard, and some worked less hard, and we had debates about whether if this person works 20 hours a day, does that mean everybody should have to work 20 hours a day? It doesn't mean that, because you can't survive that way. And we were getting close to finishing our software for Sony, and it was the 4th of July. Nobody could take the day off. And it was the evening of the 4th of July. So we set up our computers that were building software, which is a task where you kind of leave the computer alone for a while, or it used to be. And we made the text on the computers really big, turned them around to face the windows, went up on the roof of the next building over, and watched the build with binoculars while we watched the fireworks over the bay. We also drank some beers and came kind of close to the edge of the building, but nothing happened, so that's good. Just after, we had to make a decision of whether the software should be shipped to Sony or not, and it was a deadline. And we had a meeting at 3 a.m. Because we were all there, and, and that was the deadline, and so it made sense. It all made sense at the time. And the director went around the room, the VP, said, what do you think? I don't think it's ready. It's got a lot of bugs. What do you think? It crashed nine times last night. How about you? No, it's not ready. And the VP says, of course, okay, we're going to ship it. <laughs> and he was not entirely wrong. Maybe I'm being too generous. But he said, ship it, and then we'll fix it. And, you know, that's another mantra right up there with we're going to change the world. Except that one <laughs> probably comes true more often than changing the world. So we shipped it. And then I remember leaving the meeting and... <laughs> People are exhausted, they've been working a lot, and came to one of these intersections around the corner where my coworker Ludus is going around the corner and I'm going like this, and he comes up like this, and I'm like this, and neither of us wants to move, but we're gonna crash in, and Ludus, who's very, very logical, organized, scientific mind says, I'm too tired to calculate the optimal path. <laughs> And I just, I just went that way. <laughs> so we shipped. 
It wasn't a success. It was, it was a lot of things, but it was too early. It was too early to ship an email machine in 1993. People didn't know what email was. It wasn't a phone yet, it wasn't small enough yet. The networks weren't ready, the phone networks. Somebody said it was like trying to invent television in the 1880s. Kind of what it was. People didn't know what to do with the thing. So it didn't succeed. We sold very few. People started to drift away from the company. The company pivoted a few times and, and did different things. But the company really was never the same after that. A few years ago, we lost Zarco to clinical depression. And everybody got back together again in the wake of that. And including the filmmaker who was making the documentary, Sarah Karouche. Sarah decided to restart the documentary and really tell the story now of what happened to General Magic. Got hold of the original footage and interviewed people for new footage as well to put together. Because it turns out the people at General Magic hadn't faded away. They went on to do things like create the iPod, help start the iPhone and the iPad, start Android, become the chief technical officer of the United States, run the Apple Watch team, and other equally prestigious positions, all people who came from General Magic. Sarah made the documentary with Matt Maud. It premiered one year ago tonight in Silicon Valley. It actually uh, came out at, at Tribeca before that, but I'm not counting that. <laughs> a year ago tonight, the documentary General Magic premiered in Silicon Valley. It's won a number of awards. It's, it's hard for me to judge if it's a good movie or not. I think it's great, but I'm, I'm too close to it. Now, I was among those interviewed for the new footage. And of course, my interview was cut <laughs> because adjacent to greatness. That's like my brand, but I will be a DVD extra. <laughs> but, <laughs> which was, that's an ambition I didn't know I had. But I am in some of the old footage, and my favorite thing about this documentary is, in all the old footage, I'm 29 years old. <laughs> Everybody hates meetings. This is a Silicon Valley thing especially. Meetings, there are too many meetings. Why are there so many meetings? Can't we do it by email instead? Why do we have to have a meeting about it? Uh, you can look at other people's calendars with a lot of software and companies. It's called calendar stalking and it's a lot of fun. You can see these people who have two and three meetings scheduled at the same time. How do they survive? How do they do anything ever? So meetings are a problem, they're a bane. What's the solution? Well, somebody came up with no meetings Thursday. Thursday, no more meetings, henceforth. All meetings on Thursday are canceled and moved to other days. There's this beautiful Thursday with no meetings on it to get work done. A Couple weeks later, somebody says to somebody else, I need to talk to you about this, do you have time? Well, Thursday's open, everything else is completely booked. But it's no meetings Thursday. Well, just this once, just this once. Pretty soon, Thursday is booked up and no meetings Thursday is gone. So no meetings day is not the best solution. I know, I have another great idea. Let's give the conference rooms funny names. That'll fix everything. So I work for a company with thousands of conference rooms. They have to theme them according to building and floor. Like one building, all the conference rooms are named after astronauts. It's kind of cool. Another building, they're named after punctuation marks. That's weird. Another one, they're named after Minnesota State Parks. That's when you know you have too many conference rooms. <laughs> and then there's, there's the clever conference room names, like the conference room on the third floor called fourth floor, or the conference room in the corner called not here, 
or the conference room called the other room. Oh, that's so funny. It solves everything. A few years ago, I was invited to a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a VP at my company that I didn't know this person. And it just the invitation showed up and so oh, I, th I think I'll go. So I went to the building, which I didn't know, and I was almost late. And I got to the, I'm looking for the room, and then I see it. Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. It's the name of the room. I go into the room, and I sit down, and I'm waiting. And it's the time, and it's five minutes after the time. No VP. Ten minutes after, up there. Fifteen minutes after, no. Nope. Then he pings me sends me a message saying, where are you? I'm waiting for you. And I said, I'm here, I'm in the room. And he says, no, I'm in the room. <laughs> what room are you in? I said, I'm in Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion in building 46. He says, no, I'm in Newton's Laws of Motion in building 48. That's where I said we were meeting. I went to Kepler's, he went to Newton's. Now I really hate meetings. <laughs> Nobody gets murdered in Cupertino, California. At least for 39 years, that was true. On October 5th, 2011, it was kind of a gloomy day. A man walked into his office at a cement company and shot three people dead and fled. And for the rest of the morning, in Cupertino, California, a really sleepy, calm, quiet city, the streets were filled with police, Everybody was looking for this guy. Like I said, it was a gloomy day. It had a strange feeling, an, an evil feeling. Because this just didn't happen around there. They caught up with the guy. He died as well. Not clear by his own hand or by the police. 3 p.m. that day, I got a text message from a friend. Steve died. I knew who he meant even though I barely knew Steve Jobs, really. I knew he meant Steve Jobs, because Steve Jobs was very sick. It was not unexpected that he died, and yet it was incredibly unexpected. At the same time that he was so ill and in and out of the hospital and in and out of work, he had said he expected to leap from treatment to treatment like a frog from one lily pad to the next. Figure this out, get that fixed, go to the next thing, figure that out, go on. So to hear that he had died didn't seem right. It didn't register. It was true. Steve died. And then really incredible things started happening. People started feeling what it felt to have Steve Jobs having died. At Google, probably Apple's biggest rival at this time, the homepage was changed to say Steve Jobs and have his dates, and a link to Apple's homepage. It's a small thing, but uh, they've never done it before. At Microsoft, Apple's greatest rival of another time, their flags at the campus were lowered to half staff in honor of Steve Jobs. At the Apple campus, people who never met Steve Jobs would never meet him, not know him at all. Hundreds of people came to the campus and put candles and flowers there. And the Apple security allowed them in to do that, which is also unusual. And people who live in different areas went to Apple stores and turned them into memorials to Steve Jobs. Posting post-it notes 10 feet high in some places with little Notes to Steve, someone they'd never met, would never meet, who didn't directly affect their lives, but they felt something enough to go to an Apple store and write a note to him. I thought this was incredible. Next day, there was 
a different kind of memorial, but really just as powerful. That's the same store. And this time people are lined up to buy the new Apple uh, iPhone 4S. Like they always line up to buy the new iPhone. This time in front of 10 foot high notes to Steve Jobs. This is a type of memorial as well. And I think about why people would be moved to do that. They had some sort of feeling that their, their device was so personal and they attributed all that personality to this one man who was responsible for a large part of it. They put all their emotion into writing a note. And I thought, what did I feel? This guy that I didn't really know, he'd affected my life just like he'd affected theirs and probably all of yours. I, I barely met him. I got yelled at him. I got yelled at by him one time. He was a genius, a visionary, an asshole, a Buddhist, a capitalist. When I heard about his death, I just cried. I did the strangest thing. My phone rang with a number I didn't recognize and I answered it. This was a few years ago. You know, it was before robocalls were telling me that Microsoft was giving me a refund and things like that. But still, I answered the phone and I was kind of glad I did. Voice at the other end of the phone said, Scott, my name is Todd Marks. I'm working on the new Steve Jobs movie. And I'd heard of the new Steve Jobs movie, which was not the old Steve Jobs movie or the previous one, but the new one. He said, um, this movie is being directed by Danny Boyle. I thought, oh, I, I've heard of Danny Boyle. He has an Oscar. He directed Train Spotting and Slumdog Millionaire. I like that one. I, he's got an Oscar. And, and then uh, Todd continues and said, it's written by Aaron Sorkin. I know who Aaron Sorkin is. He's got an Oscar, a few Emmys, wrote The West Wing, heard of him. So I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. He says, he says we're making this movie about Steve Jobs, and we need some historical advice, and Apple won't talk to us. Will you talk to us? And I thought, why did you call me? You know, I worked there, and I was kind of an amateur historian, but Steve Jobs didn't really know him that well. So, of course, I said, sure. <laughs> sure, I'll help you out. And he said, okay, we're, we have an office in San Francisco. Can you come to the office? And I said, sure, and we picked a date, and I went up to the office, and I thought I had the wrong address because it was on Pier 80, and it was this weird old building that looked like it was about to fall over. And um, I parked my car, and this guy came out and introduced himself and said, hi, I'm Todd Marks, and I, I was at the right building after all. And I, he took me in the building, and everything changed. It was like when it goes from Kansas to the land of Oz, because inside the building it was incredible activity, except instead of being in garish colors like the Ozians, uh, everybody was wearing black, and they're running around in black, and uh, they look like ninjas or artists, and they're all working on this movie, and there are a bunch of doors uh, in the hallway, and they say things like production, costumes, design, location. And the funny thing is, when you walk through the doors, there's no interior walls. So like I walk through the door and it's the same room, so I don't know what's going on. So it's a little freaky already. I'm a little freaked out already. And he's, and he's, he's like whirlwind taking me around to meet all these people in the different departments. And I guess they knew I was coming because everywhere I go they have questions for me. Like, um, okay, we're gonna recreate the event where they introduced the Mac. Uh, did people have badges? Did they have tickets? How did they get there? Did they drive? Did they walk? Did they ride a bike? What did they wear? What were they wearing? Uh, this t-shirt, was that out that year? Or, or would they be wearing this other t-shirt? And I'm like, uh, I, I can answer one of those. And they're showing me around and then and I walk into this room and um, in this room there is a picture on the wall, printouts. I think of every page on the internet has anything to do with Apple in 1984. Like it's a big room and there's lots of printouts. 
And I start looking at these printouts like, oh, I worked there. Oh, I ate lunch there. Oh, I know who that is. I've been there. And it's like, and I think, am I in a movie about my own life? What is happening? It's very strange. And then in particular, I see one printout on the wall that looks very familiar. And I walk up to it, and it's an old Apple ad with a bunch of badges of employees. And I walk up to it and I say, that's my wife. And that's me. And then they look at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> Just an old guy, just an old guy. But I got a lot of cred out of that being on the wall. So they're asking me all these questions and I'm, I'm trying to help them out and answering their questions. And then and Todd says, oh, the director wants to say hi. Okay, great, Danny Boyle, sure. I'd love to say hi to him. Did I mention the Oscar? He doesn't carry it with him, but still. So he says he's gonna come by now. So I thought, great, he's going to say hi to me. How nice will that be? Comes by, hello, I'm Danny Boyle. And I wanted to talk to you about the movie. Steve, he probably said film, didn't he? He said, it's not a big special effects film. It's about the mind of Steve Jobs. It's about a man who wanted to make a computer that was easy for everybody to use. He, he wanted to uh, equalize the world so that everybody could use a computer. It's, it's not a photograph, it's a portrait, which was a line I heard a lot of people use later. It's because like most of it didn't exactly happen the way it is in the movie, but they kind of knew that and, and Sorkin kind of knew that. And instead of talking to me for five minutes, like I thought he would, or five seconds, he's pitching the movie to me for half an hour. I don't know why, and I think he's, I think he's practicing, okay, right? And plus he's a super nice guy. I think he would just talk this way to anybody that he met to tell them about his movie that he's clearly very excited about. And I'm excited to hear it. And he tells me all about the movie. And then um, I tell him the story about interviewing it next that I told you a little while ago. And he likes that story, he says that's such a great story. It, it shows that Steve really pushed to get what he wants. And then he was off. And then I was done and I had scheduled an hour to spend at this movie office. I ended up spending four hours there. But it was fun seeing, seeing how that worked. Oh, and before he left, he said, uh, we're shooting the intro scene in two weeks in Cupertino. Would you like to come? I said, sure. So uh, they, were, they were filming it at the same place where it took place. He said, this is really unusual. They wanted us to film in Vancouver or Georgia where it's cheap, but we really wanted to do it where it happened. And I thought, that's great. So two weeks later, I showed up at Flint Center in Cupertino, which is about to be torn down, by the way, where I was there for the Mac introduction in 1984. And there are thousands of people there as extras. And they said that normally when they call for extras on a movie, they have to pay people. And they have to put out ads and they still can't get enough people. They have to delay the shooting until they can bring in enough people. They needed 2,500 people. They sent 1,500 people away because they had 1,500 people too many. I don't know what this means. I don't know who gets the credit for that, but, but the auditorium was filled with people. And, they, and I got to watch some of the filming. Uh, oh, I walked in the side door. There was a security guard there playing on his phone. And I walked in and I thought, oh, how different from a real Apple event is this? And I walked right in and I saw uh, the people I knew there. Uh, I saw the director, I saw Todd Marks. I got to watch some scenes being filmed. It was really weird watching actors playing people I knew, saying lines that I knew they had said. Uh, it was also weird watching Seth Rogen play Steve Wozniak. <laughs> Didn't seem like it fit, but again, Portrait, not a photograph. So I watched for a while and, I, and then Danny Boyle was there and he said, would you like to sit in the audience? Maybe we'll get a shot of you in the movie. I said, yeah, sure, that sounds great. I'll be in a movie. So I went and sat in the audience that was packed and they filmed part of the intro, which I don't think they really showed that much uh, in the movie itself. But I sat in the audience for a while and it was fun and uh, it was over and I left and I got to my car and I had a parking ticket from the 
Foothill De Anza Police. Because I it was Saturday and I didn't think I had to pay, but I had to pay. So I took the thing and I thought, what would Steve Jobs do with this parking ticket? And you know what? I paid it. When I went to the movie set, I got a pass, a visitor pass. And I found out that movies have code names. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that, but I found out. This is my visitor pass for the Steve Jobs movie, codenamed RDF. Does anybody know what RDF is in conjunction with Steve Jobs? Some do. Steve Jobs was known for his reality distortion field. The reality distortion field projected from Steve whenever he gave a keynote or spoke to you in person or you watched a video. It worked over video as well. And it caused you to believe what he was telling you to believe. And if you doubt this effect, ask anyone who's experienced it, which is, a lot of people, especially who've, who've felt it personally. I walked out of a keynote once convinced I wanted an iBook that was really not that attractive looking, but I needed to have one. And then the, the effect fades over time, so if you can hold off for a while, then you can, you can resist it. So it was pretty clever that they called the movie RDF. Also, the fact that, I don't know if you can see this, but the RDF is pixelated. It has rough edges. So that's kind of like something you wouldn't do in the presence of Steve. So I got to go to a Hollywood premiere in San Francisco. Close, right? They had a premiere for the Steve Jobs movie at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. I got invited. Oh, I got this cool souvenir ticket. See? With the logo of the movie on it and a stern warning on the back not to record it or they will kill you. <laughs> so I went to the movie, I saw the people that I knew, the people that I'd met on the filming, Todd Marks, I saw Danny Boyle there, some other people, and I met Michael Fassbender who played Steve Jobs in the movie. He also has played Magneto, <laughs> who is almost as powerful as Steve. And Danny introduced me to Michael Fassbender and he said, oh yes, you're the one with the story about hiring. I love that story. I use that in my performance. And I'm like, can I put that on my resume too? <laughs> you know. But there's no recording. He didn't, I, I should have asked him to write it down, but I'm telling you. So that's almost as good. I watched the movie and I don't think it quite captured Steve Jobs, even as a, as a portrait, not a photograph. It, it, it missed somehow the essence of Steve Jobs, which was as a coach, a director, someone who could coerce, convince, put his will into other people to create what he envisioned. And the movie didn't quite do that for me, and I don't think it did that in general because it didn't do that well either, which I guess is another theme of this talk. A lot of things that didn't do well. And then came the scene where they introduced the Mac. And of course, I'm looking for me on all the crowd shots. I'm kind of over there. No, move the camera. No, I'm over there. No. Not there. I'm not there. Which means another instance of being adjacent to greatness. It fits my brand. I'm outside. I'm not in the movie. so. And I don't think I'm a DVD extra on that one. So, uh, but I did get some cool stuff. I had a great time visiting the movie set, helping them out. I got that neat RDF badge, got this souvenir ticket. And did I mention I got a parking ticket?
So whatever happened to me? <laughs> I, I started off wanting to be the there's a fire guy, wanting to work on computers, but that's not me. I'm a writer. I'm a sharer, an explainer. I'm a storyteller. That's really what I've done my whole career. And that's why I wanted to get up here and tell these stories. And everybody else can be a storyteller too because stories are part of our human experience. I learned about storytelling in tech from great people like Andy Hertzfeld, Darren Adler, who learned it from people like Woz, who learned it from I don't know who, but it's a tradition in technology and it can be in everything else. So tell your own stories. Tell them to your friends and your family. You don't have to get up on a stage, but you can. You can write them. You can write them in a blog. You can write them in a paper. You can join the moth and tell them at the moth. But storytelling is really an amazing way to pass on human experience that happens no matter what you do. And I've discovered that this is really my best contribution. I can't help invent a great device, write a great piece of software, but I can explain things. Not mansplain them, just explain them. <laughs> just tell you about them. And, and when I think about these stories, I remember one more thing. When I was interviewing at Next all those years ago, there was another phone call. About a week later, the phone rang really late at my house. I'm talking like 10 o'clock, which is unusual. And there was no caller ID. I answered the phone, and a voice said, is this Scott? And I said, yes. And he said, Scott, who works at Apple? And I said, yes. And he said, Scott, this is Steve Jobs. I wanted to talk to you one more time about this job. And I'm like, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want to. He said, you know, we'd really like you to come work here. You only get a chance to work on a few things in life. And I don't want you to regret it. And he really sounded human to me, like he was talking to me, like he knew me or knew who I was. He didn't sound mean or mad or, or like a bad person. He sounded like someone who wanted the best for me. And I said, thanks, but I'm just not going to do it. And he said, he didn't come back at me. He said, okay, I wish you the best. I wish you good luck. And he hung up. And so now, once in a while, as happy as I am with the way my career turned out, I think, do I regret it? That's all I know. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight, for coming. It's the only way I know what works, and I just like to see all you as well. Um, I want to thank Logan in the booth, Susan in the house, John on the video. Katie and Barb for inventing playful people and making this space for people to do things like this. And for, and for letting me use the theater tonight because it's not that easy to find a theater. And I want to thank my family, many of whom are here tonight, for helping me with 
every aspect of this, for putting up with my nonsense in doing this, for getting me involved in this in the first place, and especially my wife, Barbara, who's my manager, coach, dramaturg, <laughs> wife, friend. She's a lot of, lot of those. So thank you, everybody. Now it's time for cookies. <laughs> <laughs>